Hello, and welcome to the Revenue Marketing Report powered by CaliberMind. Today, we're doing something a little different. I'm joined by Jess Barr, and we are going to get on the Marketing Ops Soapbox. I'm so excited. <laughs> I think we've done this in episodes in the past, but uh, we're making it official. Yeah, let's do it. So this is going to be like coffee talk from the SNL skit. We're going to do a topic and then we'll discuss. And the topic today is 80% of CEOs don't trust or are unimpressed with their CMOs. I... In comparison, Oof. in comparison, just 10% of the same CEOs feel that way about their CFO or CIO. And this comes from a 2012 global survey by the Fournay's marketing group that has been quoted in just about every publication out there, including Forbes and a bunch of other ones. Initial reaction. I think like, oh, initial reaction, <laughs> ugh. But I, I get it because I have seen this. I spent part of my career in various revenue focused roles, but not on marketing with really, really tiny marketing teams, even though I was at companies that sold into marketing people, marketing teams. So I've seen this firsthand. I get it. It's so frustrating because I think what it comes down to, and I, I've been I've been thinking and noodling on this, and you and I have talked about a little bit, is people don't understand marketing. They right. don't understand it. They don't understand the impacts. So when you look at financial metrics, right? They're pulling reporting, they're pulling other data numbers from one source, and it's like straight linear tie right to revenue. Straight Down to the penny. There. Yeah. Down to the penny. Yeah. And you have marketers who, again, are making an impact across the entire company, not just revenue, but are you able to attract top talent? Are you a cool place to work? Are you able to retain employees? It impacts everything. But I think it's so difficult for marketers to articulate that value and show data that makes sense to a CEO, especially if they don't have a marketing background at all. Not surprised, but so annoyed. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if we're being really honest, it, it, there's some pieces that I've seen too that come from a slightly different angle. So it's using language that means something else to the rest of the business yeah. in a unique way that doesn't go over very well not being comfortable with speaking to your data and why it is and not being able to articulate why our data is different so we're yes. dealing with massive transactions across a large period of time from a bunch of disparate systems yeah. I don't think that gets articulated very well. Uh, some folks accidentally oversell the information they have as truth, and we just need to do a better job yeah. of preparing our executives to have well, those conversations. I often see the biggest time I run into this is Google Analytics compared to Salesforce, Marketo, HubSpot, whatever your, your source of truth is for that. And they're like, well, your data doesn't match. Well. I'm sorry, Brenda, my data is never going to match. I don't know if you know this, but Google is killing Google Analytics and there's a ton of data privacy. And so I'm never going to have 100% matching. But when you're accustomed to seeing systems that reconcile where it always matches, people just say, okay, it doesn't match. The data is bad. We don't know what to believe. The house is on fire. Ah, like everything's broken. Instead of, I think part of it is we have to educate our business partners in, okay, this isn't one-to-one. -one. And so what it means is we can look at our contact requests in this system and that we know is truth and we're not gonna have visibility into it because of data privacy protection, opt-outs, whatever it is. And so how we're gonna use this other data is this for early indicators. I was at a company that sold into, it was in the infrastructure space, sold into a bunch of nerds who use uh, privacy protection and don't want to be sold to and don't like advertising and opt out of everything. And our number would be guilty. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> and I'm a marketer, so there. <laughs> Listen, I'll give you my data if I have a better experience. But, you know, when we look at it, we, you know, we were confident that we were missing 40 to 50% of our Google Analytics tracking because people opted out of it or they, they had privacy. And yeah, it's not, it's not going to match. And when the executive team, who I will say often like bold statement, I think a lot of our CMOs out there, they have been working for quite a while. They didn't grow up digitally native 
in their careers. It's not, I think there's a bit of a learning curve to really being super fluent in digital metrics and what it all means and how it works and all that. And so having teams that can really support and give you everything you need. So you as a CMO can go in and have that conversation, educating the rest of your executive team or the board often on what are those metrics, what's important. I, I'm Listen, we both, I think you're not on the same page that MQLs aren't dead, but if you just report on MQLs and your board's just asking for MQLs, that's not your best indicator. There's a problem no. with yeah. that, you know? Yeah. yeah. So. It should be one tool in the toolbox. Like, I'm not a fan of throwing anything completely yeah. out, but big picture. And I'm, I didn't tell you this, but I'm literally writing a book on how B2B CMOs can become more data literate. Yes. <laughs> I love but, it. <laughs> so one of the things I wish I could get across is that, so I've worked with a lot of CEOs that are either from a technical engineering background yeah. or they're from finance. And I kind of hit the same problem with both of those audiences, even though they're coming from different directions. So like you mentioned, the CEO with the financial background, they're used to everything balancing down to the penny. They wanna know for every dollar in, how many dollars do they get out by channel, by campaign, by tactic. Yep. And, eh. and yeah. then on the other side of the coin, you've got the engineers who conceptually think they know what's possible yeah. and have a very high bar and don't understand why you can't hit that bar without additional resources. If I could throw in a trend I see among many technical yes, and financial do. people is they mm -hmm. also think that marketers, marketing's bad. And they're like, well, I don't, I think I know marketing better than marketers do. And yeah, yes, I keep it's this that. intuitive thing yeah. that I can do. Yeah. That like, I do. saw, you know, Okay, we'll not talk about MQLs and redacted for this conversation because that's a whole dedicated conversation. But I'll be, I've read a blog, I, some of the other day, uh, you know, I got hit up by a BDR about this tech. And as soon as I did, I started getting followed around the internet with ads. So we should have campaigns that are triggered off what BDRs do. I'm like, no, did you go to their website? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I went to the website. You're getting retargeted from the website. So like, let's, let's talk through what that looks like, but they'll see, they'll, they'll think they have this view of how, and I feel like I'm just ranting at this point. No, I love it. This is a soapbox. Of how marketing should run, but they don't know how marketing actually operates or what you can and can't do. Like, I would love to follow every single person around the internet the moment that they engage with us, but I can't because yep. they're not opted in and I don't want to force, I don't want to be creepy. I don't want to stalk someone. Yeah. I want them to opt into us and then consume our content because that's a better experience. So it's like they also, I think because often they solve really challenging things, especially on the engineering side, Yeah. right? They're building platforms, they're launching these products, and these companies that are solving really challenging things. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the halo effect. We're like, well, I figured this out and this is really complicated and marketing is like, marketing's easy. So I can do this too. I can do market, like Elon Musk syndrome here. So like, so you can predict human behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, you can help me understand like, uh, someone's behavior across different devices and sessions when they're not cookied or tracked. You can just magically like figure that out. Like, tell me more. So, so since we're ranting, <laughs> one of my hot topic, hot topics is, um, digital is trackable. That's the same thing, right? Like anything you do online, they can see, and then you can just do a report that tells us stuff. Can I get like PDF analytics too while we're on it? Oh, you went there! Because <laughs> <'cause laughs> that one I love. Yeah, I, I love, um, actually I will like just, you know, worked with someone in the past on the marketing side who always asked for PDF views for analytics. I'm like, you can't see that. Like, do you want clicks on the link to view the PDF? I can get you that. But until we get like an embedded platform or something third party, like there are platforms that solve that, but it's not a PDF. It's like a PDF experience. But that's what it reminds me of too, whenever it's like, yeah, you know, GDPR never happened. Castle never happened. We, we can't do that. And if you could, like, let's imagine a world. Let's imagine, let's go back in time. Let's get our time machine. We're back in the late 90s when nothing met, like no regulations on anything. 
you still couldn't track it all. That's still a ton of data. That's still a ton. That is so much. And you're assuming that everything is cookie and they're cookie across device somehow because they logged in. You're probably using Facebook or some platform. Like that's still really hard to do if you could legally do it all. Right. Right. Yeah. And I will lawyer you. I will, I will, yeah. do, I will build a case in five different directions yeah. because one, it's not just castle and GDPR. It's this privacy first movement, which we could debate whether or not that's altruistic or not. It's not. <laughs> but you've got providers like Apple who yeah. are even giving the ability to mask IP addresses. Yeah. And, and we could go into the whole like VPN, how many times your IP address cycles, all that good stuff. Um, but like the other piece of that is IP addresses, that whole universe changed the minute everybody started working from home. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I get ads for stuff that other that my husband looks at and I'm like what are you what are you googling why am I getting targeted for like this weird stuff uh nothing like super inappropriate but I got like a like a hunting weekend in like Africa and I was like that's okay cool but like what are you what are you googling like what are you doing are you on vacation you haven't told me about like What's going on? But yeah, as soon as you start from home, right, you don't have corporate phone numbers anymore. Direct mailing. We had an event I ran in beginning of the pandemic, so June 2020. And we're like, you know, we'd love to get people's mailing addresses also to help our sales team realize, figure out where people are sitting. And you wouldn't believe it. The cost of an, of an address and a phone number is a sticker pack. It was like a $3 sticker pack. We had like 2,000 plus registrants for it. But so many people are, I think it's not just harder to hit them, harder to figure out where they are. They also, I think, feel more invaded when you send them something to their home as a surprise versus sending. A lot of the direct mailing companies have adjusted well, but there's a different like consumption model that people want to take when they are working from home, especially during the, the panorama. But it's... <laughs> I think it just <laughs> sounds more fun than pandemic. Yeah, you know, and it just never ends. So I know a, that view that just keeps going. Oh my gosh, it's it's um it's interesting now because I get I get direct mailing to my house for like postcards and I don't want to say flyers because it's not quite a flyer, but I got one the other day from Postal, and so I'm starting to get business solicitations to my home address. And it's starting to just feel normal that I have physical spam in my mailbox from companies trying to pitch me, Yeah, which is a weird experience. I feel like before the pandemic, it was just so inappropriate and out of line to send anything to someone's home address. But Well, I mean, I think things have blurred so much. You look at the usage of LinkedIn and how, like, there is yes. stuff on there I never thought <laughs> And I, I'm not happy about some of the changes. Like, and if you hit me up like on Instagram or Facebook trying to sell me something, my reaction is so different than yeah. when you do that on LinkedIn. Like LinkedIn, I'm like, I expect yeah. this. No, it definitely is. It definitely is blurred. LinkedIn in general is interesting because I'm seeing. I think that the the pandemic and the work from home change, specifically working from home being normalized. Understanding, like, I posted, you know, I started a new job recently, and my introductory slide had my dogs in it. I never would have done that, like, five or six years ago. I never would have done that. And it's so much more acceptable to be a human being and have a life outside of work. I'll also say, I think that companies, especially tech companies, are becoming more human and understanding, like, we should... Yeah, you have unlimited PTO, and it's not just a, a cost-saving measure for us as a company not to have to pay out your vacation time when you leave and to keep you tied to work, but now we actually want you to take PTO and have more healthy work-life balance and avoid burnout. Um, it's something blurry, but LinkedIn is, is, for me, interesting when I see people post just really, really personal stuff. I did. I got COVID back in the day and I did post it to LinkedIn because I just disappeared for a month. Yeah, yeah. And I shared it with everyone to like give them an update. And I was a bit like, Ooh, should I post this? And afterwards people did make comments to me that it wasn't appropriate to share on LinkedIn. What? And I was like, well, 
I disappeared from communication with every single person in the world for a month. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to share it. And people reached out and they were like, they were happy that they got an update on it. Yeah. But it is interesting how some people really post some stuff that maybe I wouldn't, but they, it's their, you know, it's their brand. It's their, how they want to build their, their thing. So. Well, and as a potential um, employer, sometimes it's good to know these things up front. So, yes. So going back to our, our topic of the hour with, yes. with CEOs not having faith in, in their CMOs, mm -hmm. do you think that partially plays into it too? If they're saying their CMO is like posting about things that are not work related and how they're kind of putting themselves out there. Do you think that's any, any tie in? For the most part, that's not where I see the distrust yeah. come from unless they're doing something vastly inappropriate, which does happen. You know, you do those HR yeah. training videos and you're like, wow, why do we even need this? And you think about like yeah. three years ago when it actually happened at a company you're at and you're like, oh yeah. And you're like, oh yeah. People do this. <laughs> Uh, for the most part, what I, I normally see is somebody come in hot, make a bunch of promises without knowing what state everything is in yeah. and not be able to meet those goals because, you know, they don't have the systems in place to do the tracking. And then yes. I think it just leaves a sour taste in people's mouths when you start with all of these promises and then can't live up to it for whatever reason, yeah. you still set an expectation that you didn't live up to. Yeah. And I would put forth a lot of marketing success is dependent on partnering with your operations team. Absolutely. It's dependent on partnering with sales ops to make sure that whatever you're doing on the marketing side is measurable in the same system as whatever your source of rec source of truth is. You know, if you're operating in HubSpot and all of your activities in HubSpot and nothing pushes into Salesforce, yes, it's always going to be two separate systems. There's always going to be distrust there. Yes. There's innately just going to be. And so really partnering with the rest of the org. But if the company isn't giving you budget for the tools to measure and isn't giving you headcount mm -hmm. for someone to run the tool to measure, not just buying tech to replace a human being, it's hard to get there. And so you have to like, they have to be willing to invest in the measurement to prove the success and to understand what's working, what's not working. I think often I found, uh, in people that I mentor, especially with earlier stage companies that getting that budget to understand this is a tool for the company is hard because they see it as like, well, it's a marketing tool and marketing's marketing right now is a cost center, not a revenue center. So like, you don't need it. It's like, this is a company tool. This is, this is my, my stance on what attribution platforms mess up is when the reps come in and they sell into marketing and they don't sell it as a company tool. They say it's a marketing tool for marketing attribution so that marketing can prove their value separate from sales instead of this is a tool for the company to understand what is working to drive opportunity creation and conversion and accelerate deals and it's for the company you know, it's very, it can be very divisive to put marketing in a corner and make it marketing versus the world for resources. And then you have to be against other teams. So you have to prove your value. And yeah. it's like a, just a never ending cycle of unhappiness. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull back the iron curtain for a minute and, and tell you why marketers market it that way. So <laughs> attribution the majority of people who approach us for attribution are really in it because um, they perceive that the rest of the executive team isn't bought into what they're doing and they want yeah. a mechanism to prove it. So that's why we do pitch it like that. I think the rarer uh, reason, but I wish I was seeing more and more of, is what somebody like you just comes in asking for is the ability for full vis visibility so you can understand what's working and what isn't and then use that to iteratively uh, improve unfortunately i would say probably more than 50 50 it's more about how do i prove uh marketing's contribution is, yeah. is what we're leading with so i think i agree with you in that it shouldn't be positioned that way and we shouldn't care about that first but i see a bit of weakness on the side of the cmo and building a business case that is compelling for the rest of the organization yeah. which it's is exactly the situation yeah yeah if that yeah 
And if you have a CMO who you as a CEO don't trust, mm -hmm. are they in a position to make recommendations for your entire business? Probably not. Yeah. They should be. Yeah. Because that's where marketing, I think, can be most impactful mm -hmm. is how they impact the entire organization. Yes. With yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because my yeah. team isn't just responsible for new logo acquisition. We are cheerleaders for the organization to attract talent. Yep. We are uh, trying to delight our existing customers and see how we can turn that into evidence and use cases that other customers can benefit from. Yeah. There's just such a range. Running on events. There's, yeah. yeah. It's really a, a service a provider to the entire company at every function. I mean, especially staffing right now it is such a ridiculous job market uh, on that side too. So what do you, what do you think is the solution to help marketers gain that trust and that strength in the, with the exec team and the CEO? I really a hundred percent agree with your comment that you have to partner really closely with your operations person. I think there needs to be more transparency when we don't understand something and we need to ask more questions as leaders. So if I think something is working a certain way, I'm going to say that out loud to the person who's in charge of it and have them verify or, or say, no, actually this is, this is how it works, but that will better equip me to have the more in depth conversations that the executive team's looking yeah. for. I think the other big thing is the realization that the rest of the executive team needs to have that this is never going to be a down to the penny perfect recording system. And what you should be looking for in a CMO is somebody who can recognize a problem and come up with a solution to adjust. And that doesn't take A plus perfect reporting. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, uh, agree. I also like what you said earlier about speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. I've ran into so many executives who who call an inbound anything marketing does, and it's like, well, hold on, like <laughs> let's <laughs> let's split that up. You know, mm -hmm. let's kind of get there. So getting on the same language, and then I always think of it on the data side. Your data is often not going to be perfect, as you're saying, but is it consistent over time? And so can you find trends? So even if your data isn't 100% perfect, if your collection method maintains the same way, if there's no new variables introduced, can you find trends in the data to help you understand if something's getting better or worse and then start moving those trends around? Because if your data is wrong, as long as it's consistent, the deltas still matter. Those deltas are correct with it. That That's is my brilliant and perfect and absolutely correct. I'm like, whoa, you're right. Like as long as you're consistently defining things the same way. Yeah. If a change happens, it's still meaningful. Yeah. I used to work in manufacturing back. I started my career designing production lines and doing statistical process control. And we were doing uh, work in a cell and we realized that the, the operator, um, this is gonna be shocking, but didn't know how to read a tape measure. Uh, and so he was messing it up, but he was recording every, he was consistently wrong with every measurement. Oh. So it was fine. It was still right when we compared it to each other. It just was wrong in the actual data points. And, and that, that, that experience, like early in my career, like set the tone for my approach to data forever. That's brilliant. Because even if it's wrong, also don't assume someone knows basic things because he, yeah. He just wasn't familiar with it and he was measuring on the wrong spot. So always like double check your measurement methods and your data, like check your dates when you're pulling a report, you know, they can sometimes surprise you. Um, but yeah, as long as it's consistent over time, comparison data is a great way to look at it too. We get so stuck, I think often in, is the data good? Is it clean? Is it enough? And it's, it's missing the forest for the trees. Yes. So we have a ton of data. Cool. But what does it matter? Because I said it before, and I will say it again. If you're not doing something with your data, you're a hoarder. Yeah. And you don't hoard data. Okay. You're going to end up on hoarders because you're, because you got to, you had data lakes full of just mangled trash data and not a clean data warehouse. You're not doing anything with it. There's no need in collecting if you're not going to do something actual with you, if you're not looking at it, analyzing it, 
and making something of it. You know, we don't need to store it just to store it. My favorite thing to point out is if you're looking at your numbers quarterly, you're too late. Because yes. if you're looking at it on a weekly basis and you see a pipeline issue in month, you know, at the end of month one, you have a chance to do something about it. And that is such a compelling story to tell to the board as opposed to, man, looks like we really missed this quarter. All three months were just, they tanked. Yeah. It doesn't need to be that way. It kills me when I see people produce quarterly reporting in Google Docs. Mm -hmm. It's taking you, what, an hour and a half, two hours to pull that? There is no way you're looking at it regularly if it's taking that much time to put it together. Oh, usually, yeah. so we did the research, it's three to five days out of a month. And, and yeah. if you don't have the investment in tools that can automate that for you, yeah. you're going to have a reactive organization. Yeah. Exactly. That's just all there is to it. Exactly. I, so back in the day, uh, I was going through and doing a campaign, and so I presented all my, my audience building for it. And I remember when I, when I showed it to like the sales leadership team, they're like, that data is wrong. Like that's not our audience size. And I was like, no, I, I pulled, you know, we had a name to count list. I'm like, I pulled the list and like, mm -hmm. that's the size. And it was like 20,000 accounts and they expect to be like five. And it's like, no way it's that big. I'm like, yeah, no, like that's the size of the audience. Like, don't you guys look at your account list? Like no one, no one's looking at the the number of accounts that your reps are targeting. Like that's not a thing you guys ever look at. And so I went back and looked at when, when they were created, when they changed status. And yeah, they just slowly over the course of like four or five months, just slowly creeped up. And so it was very clear. No one's looking at the data. No yeah. one's looking at it. And it got totally out of control to the point that it was just overly inflated. And then they had to go cut it back down. So we're able to bring in then actually, actually it was Keller mine at the time. So we brought in and did some, uh, made a little temperature grading for it that they helped set up. If you're not looking at the data, you don't know when it's going to go out of control and you're missing all that. I'm a huge fan of active alerting when you can set it up for that too. So if your conversion rate hits a certain threshold, if you start seeing that you're not getting, you know, certain performance, whatever, like alert you to go look at it, but you gotta, you gotta be looking at it, you know, you gotta be doing something with it. Oh, this felt good. This, yeah. This felt good. It's, uh, I heard a stat that a while ago, I'll find it and share it. And I don't remember where I heard it from, but I'm pretty sure I'm quoting it correctly. And I, I think it was like only 70% of uh, marketing teams actually measure any attribution or, or stats around what they're doing at all, which is always kind of shocking to me that they wouldn't be. Because how do you measure, like, how are you doing your work? Like, how are you measuring your program impact? How are you figuring out what you're doing, you know, if you're not going through and measuring it? So I found the stat, three out of every four marketers and their marketing leaders that were surveyed use data to make decisions. Okay, so here's what I'll say, though. Okay, here's what I'll say. I think... People think that they're using data and they're like making a decision and then they're finding their data to back the decision up. Or they're saying, you know, I think, I think, you know, I think if we do messaging based on, uh, on vertical or industry, like that's the way to go. And so let's see how it is. And let's go look at how our vertical content performs. Oh, I think it's doing well. Like, let's go do it. I would not being cynical, but being cynical. I, I think self-reporting that feels like people probably aren't I it bogs it bugs me when people are like I'm really data focused and it's like no you're not <laughs> you you're cherry picking your data the fact is we've been talking about b2b data driven decision making and marketing for decades yeah I think oh, I'm seeing the change now I am seeing a lot of organizations change their priorities and understand that they shouldn't be looking at data as a cost yeah. because of the power it gives them to it's make better investment. decisions. Yeah. 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 Finally. Yeah. I do think in the last three or four years, I would say I think data is becoming more commonplace in a lot of these conversations. I will credit it partially to the rise in data science as a practice, 
how much more prevalent it is. You know, when I did my master's, there were 12 of us in the cohort. And I think the most recent cohort started had like 90 or 100 people in it. And it's, it's becoming a lot more common. And part of it too is you need the org to all speak the same language. So if you're in a company where no one's really looking at the data for performance and all they care about is bookings and they don't care about pipeline, they don't care about early indicators, engagement, nothing else, and all they're, they're just focused on bookings and maybe churns and renewals, whatever it is, you're not going to be in a spot where you're really thinking about the data across the board. And you're not going to value it. And so you're not going to want to invest in it and need it versus orgs. I think why we see it so much on the consumer side where they are more data focused is you're often living based on what you're selling. You're living on sales and everything ties straight into revenue. And when you're selling a product and you're doing a Facebook ad for a t-shirt and you can have straight click through conversions, it's so much easier than the B2B sales cycle where you might spend a year trying to get into an account. And it takes touch points from your executive team, board outreach, sending direct mailing to them repeatedly. I'm a sucker for swag. You know, anyone send me swag and I'll take it. Uh, and, you know, marketing touches and sales touches. And it's all these touch points that go into creating a deal versus advertising where it's, it's the one advertising and maybe retargeting to get them in the funnel and some email marketing, just not quite as straightforward. And I think it's easier to measure and more needed on the B2C side where here on B2B, it doesn't, it's not as straightforward. It's harder to do. So people just don't do it. And they just focus on the thing that is measurable, which is closed one opportunities. It gives me hope though, because usually B2B is about three to five years behind B2C and to see where that has gone, it gives me hope that we'll get there. Yeah. I think um, we're going to see a lot of changes in marketing management and where those managers are coming from. It used to be that you'd never even think about an operations person hitting VP level in marketing. I think that's going to change. I agree. <laughs> What makes me really excited for the future is, and this is like a very like specific, probably weird path to go down, event marketers. So yes. when I first had to hire my first event marketing person, I introduced, mm -hmm. I interviewed probably, probably like 50, 60 people. And oh my, cause I also, I assume some people are bad at resumes and I want to talk to everyone cause maybe they're just yeah. bad at putting themselves on paper. And I would say a majority of them are like, what are your metrics you're measured on? Would say, if people like the event, well, how the reception was for it internally, how many leads I got, you know, how much oh, traction, yeah. how much booth, how much booth traction at a trade show. And there were a few that would say like, yeah, I tie it into revenue, revenue source, uh, pipeline sourced, and if it converts or not. Mm -hmm. Recently, I've been talking to more and more event, mar event marketers, and I'm finding more and more of them are saying, yeah, no, I have a bookings and a pipeline number. I have a target Wonderful. for it. And that's my goal. Wonderful. So I am doing yes. you know, this event because here's my pipeline goal from it. Here's how I am working with our sellers to make sure that we're setting meetings for it. Here's how it's tied to revenue. And event marketing for, I think, a long time was something that was just all, all soft metrics, all yep. soft metrics. And now that industry is tying into revenue and you have event teams that are sitting on revenue marketing teams and you have revenue marketers that are coming from the event side of the house. Yep. And that yep. is for me is like a huge positive wow. indicator that, <clears throat> that there's a, a change in tides across wow. the board for it. Well, and it's really only possible with multi-touch attribution because if using Caliber Mind, I look at our events and there's such a long tail effect with them and that it's not just drawing people in, it's in-flight deals and existing customers yeah. you're engaging with. Like I, I can't name an event we've done where we didn't invite customers. Yeah. And then that has an impact. Yeah. Now that we're able to actually measure that, we can give people pipeline. Yeah. And revenue goals. But I do, I would say I am optimistic. I have an intern starting soon who specifically wants to work in marketing analytics. She wants to get better with the data. Like I'm seeing more and more uh, younger people coming into their career who want to start in data roles. More and more people want to really learn how to do reporting and be self-sufficient with it and are understanding like this is needed for whatever my my role is within marketing, even if it's design, like designers asking for marketing, for information, how their content's performing, who it's engaging with. So I do think there is 
a change in tide. I think it's going to be painful, though, for some of the marketers who've been, you know, in a world where they don't have to understand the data and they don't have to report on it and present it, and they don't have good teams that are going to be able to manage up and help them understand how to present it. I think it's going to be a rough transition for some. Well, and I feel like if I could look into the crystal ball, I think there will be an overcorrection and then we'll hit a happy middle, meaning that we will hire people who are extremely data literate and minded and um, don't necessarily prioritize creativity or like taking risks. And that's such an integral yeah. part of marketing that we need. I think we're going to we're going to swing the pendulum too far and then land in the middle, but I'm excited for when it all shakes out and we have um, a more versatile group. Yeah. Just because you can measure it doesn't mean you need, you need to measure it. And just because you can't measure it doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it still. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not yeah. worth doing. There's it. also, I've been, uh, I started recently saying this to people and they've been like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't think about it that way. So I'll, I'll say it is um, just because you can measure it doesn't mean you should measure it or you have to measure it. Yeah. And just because like something, it doesn't mean it, it's okay to say we can measure that, but we're not going to. It's okay to say yeah. that. You can say like, we, we have this metric. We know it's important to you. We understand why, but like, let's align on the end goal with it because that metric is actually really difficult for us to measure. It's going to be coming yes. up. The whole the whole Google Analytics G4 situation, I think, is going to drive a lot of that. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we'll, mm -hmm. we'll, you know, we'll table that for when they come out with more information about it. But yeah, yeah. there's there's a lot of stuff yeah. that's just really difficult to tie into. Well, I know I enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> Where can people find you online to network? Uh, I am on LinkedIn just be work yeah linkedin is the best spot on twitter put a pixel on it um which ironically and when i've had to fight engineering teams to get tracking and pixels on site and they like don't like it and they're really really pro data privacy i'm like yeah my twitter handles literally put a pixel on it so um <laughs> let's just just make that happen so yeah put a pixel on it linkedin uh, always happy to connect and chat data analytics attribution any of this stuff so big thank you to our listeners. If you enjoy, please rate, review, subscribe, tell two friends. And if you have feedback for us or want to join the Soapbox Rant, email hello at calibermind.com.